Atamare. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good to see you all here. I'm Sharon Fifield uh, from Queenstown Business Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and thank you for coming along to the third and final of our staff housing information series, which is um, I'm really pleased we stepped into this space. It seemed a lot of people need this information. So hopefully it's been helpful to many of you and to those watching online. Um, we couldn't have done this without um, a couple of people I want to acknowledge or a couple of um, organisations. So um, Te Hotoka, the Southern Lakes Wellbeing Group, um, they have been very generous in uh, sponsoring this series, which has allowed us to make it free for our members and also non-members to come along and also allowed us to live stream it as well. So thank you very much to them. But also thank you to Kelly, who is a little bit immobile at the moment, who has actually um, done all the grunt work behind the scenes to pull this together and all of the speakers. So thanks to Kelly. Um, so we'll kick off. So today we've got two amazing speakers. So we'll start with Julie Scott from the Queenstown Lakes Community Housing Trust, um, who will give us an update. And then followed, um, we have some questions after Julie. And then we have Hayley Stevenson from uh, Housemart, who will answer all of your property um, management questions. So over to you, Julie. Thank you. Struggle in Queenstown has been real. Finding accommodation, finding somebody to call your own didn't seem actually realistic for us for a long time. That's um, a common message that we hear from a lot of people and this is one of our households, uh, he was one of our households, he still is actually. Um, and that, you know, we have 870 households on our waiting list and we hear this kind of message all the time. So this is, this is us, this is what we're about, this is um, our purpose here is providing affordable community housing solutions. Um, so a few fast facts about us, we've been going for 16 years, we were initiated by QLDC, so as part of their housing strategy in the early 2000s, they, they, they came up with a housing strategy and there were 32 recommendations, and out of those one of, was to create an independent housing trust. Now we needed to be independent so we could tap into central government uh, funding as well as local government funding which council provides and I'll talk a little bit about the inclusionary housing process. Uh, we, we're governed by six trustees so we have um, five from Queenstown and one based over in Wanaka. We have here we've got 3.5 FTE so we're a pretty small team but um, we work pretty efficiently and we're growing all the time. We have three councillor liaisons as part of that relationship with council. We have three councillor liaisons and they come along to board meetings. They don't have voting rights, they just participate, they give us feedback. We've got the shared goal with council of 1,000 homes by 2038, so that's building or facilitating the creation of another 1,000 community homes. Um, currently we're still at just under 100, but we're on our way up there to achieve that goal at some stage soon. We've got a pretty big balance sheet, as you can see here, um, through the piggy bank. We've got 55 million worth of net assets, so we're, we're growing that all the time, and I'll show you where the, the bulk of that capital has come from in a, in a slide or two. To date, we've helped 253 households. So someone mentioned in one of the first series that that's not a huge number for an organisation that's been going for 15 years. But I, I, I responded to that saying, look, you know, for the first 15 years, we've really been growing the capacity of the trust, and now we're in the stage of scaling up. We've got 100 homes under construction at the moment. So a bit more about us. Um, just quickly, we're a recognised leader and a bit of an innovator in the community housing sector. We're regulated with the Community Housing Regulatory Authority, which sits under, or well, central government sits under the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development. We're an active member of our peak body, Community Housing Aotearoa, so we sign up to that and we engage with other um, organisations around the country, share information, very collaborative sector, which is, um, is a great part of being part of that chip sector. Um, we contract to the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development to deliver public housing, so that's for those who may also know it as social housing. Many years ago, many moons ago, it was called state housing. Semantics, it's the same thing. So 
in our district currently, Kainga Ora, previously known as Housing New Zealand Corporation, has 13 properties across Queenstown and Wanaka. We currently contract to HUD, Ministry of Housing and Urban Development, and we have 40 tenancies. So we're delivering about three times as much as KO in this district. Um, and we also partner with local social services agencies to provide wraparound services. So, you know, we're not ourselves in the business of um, providing budgeting advice and um, social work, that kind of thing, but we can certainly refer people to, to the right entities. So I talked before about capital funding sources, um, inclusionary zoning. I won't go into details too much because I don't think you're here, but it, it, I think it is of interest for people to understand the philosophy behind it. So inclusionary housing is, was what we call it now. Uh, it used to be called inclusionary zoning, so you will hear the two, two terms quite a bit interchanged. But essentially, my take of it is that when land is rezoned, let's say from rural to residential, it creates huge uplift in value of that land. Now, not a sod of soil has turned but suddenly the underlying zoning of the land mean that, means that the land is suddenly worth a heck of a lot more than it was previously. Now council, local council, has facilitated that and enabled that rezoning and therefore enabled the value uplift. So council says to the land developer, if we enable this uplift, get value uplift for you, we want you to give a little bit of, capture a little bit of that value uplift back to the community for the purposes of affordable housing. So that's kind of the basic philosophy behind it. And it makes sure that there's enough affordable housing in the district for low to moderate income workers. To date, 38.5 million of land and cash has been received by us through this process. As you can see, we've also received some Crown grants. And from council itself, a lot of people talk about council not doing anything for housing in the district. You can see there the Inclusionary housing has been facilitated by council and on top of that council gives us a small operating grant every year and they've delivered us two big pieces of land, both based in Arrowtown. Um, we talk about the housing continuum and I guess it's quite important to understand it in our sector. You know, one, down one end you've got emergency housing and then you've got public housing and then you've got assisted rental perhaps for people who don't qualify for public housing but we still think that they need some form of assistance. We might offer them 80% of market rent. Um, and then we have a rent to buy program which we call Rent Saver here and that's where they pay a low market rent but they commit to a savings plan and at the end of the five years they transition into our next program which is along the continuum called the Secure Home Program. Now that's essentially an assisted ownership model, it's a leasehold model. And then the idea of course is that they move along the continuum and hopefully one day into independence and that might be market rental, that might be independent ownership. Um, a bit of a breakdown of our programs. We also used to run a shared ownership program which a lot of you might be familiar with and essentially that worked, the household would buy 70% and we'd own 30%. We moved away from that, we, we stopped offering that anymore. We have got a few legacy households out there but it's not on offer anymore. So now we have 47 households in our secure home program, we have another 46 in affordable rental and that includes public housing, we have a smaller number there, 14 in rent saver, 13 in senior housing and 8, or 880 households on our waiting list. It is going up every day. It is um, phenomenal what's happening there. And just a really quick look at the breakdown of that waiting list. So, because this is quite important to understand and it, it's, it's determined how we have evolved as a trust and who we're helping over the years. So 260 households are single person households. And then you've got 155 are couples. Um, on top of that, 145 are single parents with children. So over half our waiting list could be serviced with a one or two bed apartment. So that just gives you something to think about um, and the need and that helps us understand what the need is and what we need to work towards. Now we've got 280 sort of more traditional families and 40 senior housing. So they're over 65 living in the district. All these people are over six, uh, uh, living in the district have residency status as a minimum or citizenship. Um, apart from the seniors, every, at least one person in the household is in full-time employment and there's obviously income caps to meet. Um, this is, this is Māori and Pacific, so of those 880 households, 90 identify as Māori and Pacific. 
So just really quickly, the shared ownership program, it worked really well when entry level prices were around 500k. Um, we'd come along, we'd chip in with 150, they'd have 350. But what happened was it felt like almost overnight prices started jumping up to 750. So it, it became too much for us to put into one single household. And there was also some, some lucky households were making really big windfall gains because they got in at just the right time. And whilst that is great for them, of course, that's how the property market works. At the same time, we're saying, well, we've got 600 or more households on our waiting list. So if there's capital gains to be made, it should stay with the trust so that we can help as many people as po possible. So we moved away from that model and we came up with the Secure Home Program. So we'll just see if it plays now. We have been living in our new home now for just over a year. Um, it has changed our lives. It's amazing to uh, to you know find that security. We love our home. It's 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 ours. Uh, I think that's the the best thing. We have a beautiful garden. Um, the kids are, are fenced. You know, for a young family, that's really really awesome. Yeah, that's 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 the kind of feedback that we we hear when people move into our um, properties with us. So the basic premise of the Secure Home pro <coughs> Program, excuse me, is that the trust owns the land and the household buys the improvements. So we separate the land from the improvements. We say, okay, you buy the improvements, which is the house, at the cost it costs us to build it. And then we will own the land and we'll charge you a ground rent on the land, but we set that ground rent very low. I've got some numbers coming up, but typically households might be paying around $100 a week in ground rent. So it just means that they can go out there, they can get a mortgage and deposit, buy the home and not have to worry about paying for the land. Um, the, it's a... It is a lease, a leasehold program, so it's a 100-year lease, and the ground rent will only ever go up with CPI while they're in there. So there's none of that, you know, historically in New Zealand, leasehold, residential leasehold has a really bad name because there's a 21-year, the old 21-year Glasgow lease where people get, um, suddenly it goes up to market and they're in a lot of trouble. That never happens under our program. But in fact, the longer they stay in there, the greater the benefit comes to them. If they want to exit the program and exit the property, they have to sell back to us. We have to buy it back. We buy it back at the original purchase price plus inflation. And also, whilst they're in the property, they take care of rates, maintenance, insurance, and the likes. And they can make improvements to the property and we'll factor that into the resale price. Um, so it works really well and it tracks everything. The program is essentially tracking everything to CPI. It's taking the wild fluctuations of the property market out of the equation. <coughs> um, right, here we go. A little bit of an example. So this is an example of a home in Longview, which is hardware that we're building at the moment. It's costing us 420 to build. That's total, total turnkey home. So we're talking driveway, landscaping, fencing, the works. The household moves in with just their fridge, freezer, and their washing machine. Everything else is there. Let's say they have a deposit of 15%, which they will get through their KiwiSaver, Homestart grant, savings, etc. Um, and then they get a mortgage of 350000 which is, you know, in today, it, it, it's doable. So they, based on 6%, you probably can't see that, but 6.5% um, interest rate, 30-year mortgage, their weekly mortgage repayments, principal and interest, are $521. Now let's assume another 100 bucks for rates, insurance, mortgage, uh, maintenance, and ground rent of 100 bucks. Roughly, to buy into this program and buy this property under the secure home model, they're paying around $720 a week. Now if they would go to the free market and rent that property, they're paying, let's say, 780 so you can see that they're in a better financial position in this property, under this program, than if they were to be renting it. And they're also at the same time, they've got that security of tenure, 100 years they can stay there if they can last that long. And they're also um, paying off their principal. So they can pay down their principal. In theory, someone could pay off their mortgage in total and stay in the property only paying us ground rent. I think most people have a bit of a driver 
to move on and to move along that continuum towards independence. So what, what we like to say there, that's a, this is one of our um, properties down in Nairn Square, Lake Hayes Estate, that was our first development, is that the households have all the benefits of home ownership except their ability to make big capital gains. That stays with the trust. Um, and the house, of course, remains in community ownership because we buy it back when they want to sell. And we have this little catch cry. We like to say it's a nest, not a nest egg, because that's what we're here for, to provide secure, affordable housing, not to provide a retirement plan for people. I've got one more little clip here for you. <clears throat> then in the Housing Trust has allowed us to plan better for our future. We've been able to plant roots into our community and grow with it and start to build our lives. We went from being renters to being homeowners in less than a month. And we were paying more in rent than we are for our mortgage now. So that's massive, really. So that's a really quite a young couple um, over in Wanaka. Being in the housing. And, um, you know, it's it's a game changer being able to help these younger people. And, and we, we do find that the younger generation are probably a bit more open to this type of model because it's not a traditional model for New Zealand and it does take some time to get their heads around, but the young ones are a bit more open to it. I talked before about the eligibility criteria, but it, it's all basically there. The income cap for a single person under our programs, the ultimate income cap is 85000 and for multiple people, so two or more, it's 130,000. And we're governed by um, central government's restrictions around that. Um, this just gives you a bit of a snapshot of what we've got going on at the moment and over the next probably three or so years. You can see there's lots coming on stream. 60 sections are coming to us. This is all sections that are hopefully coming to us. The ones in orange, actually, they're a little bit... Um, maybe a bit of a, a, wish, a wish list at the moment. There's a, the Ladies Mile is obviously being developed, but whether council's able to get the inclusionary housing um, district plan rules that they're proposing through in time is yet to be determined. But there's still, as you can see, there's lots here, lots going on. 60 sections are coming to us in Coneburn, which is um, going through the earthworks at the moment, I believe, and it's just coming back to us from Hanley's, next door to Hanley's farm there. Another nine over in Arthur's Point. Um, I think we're receiving two sections in Mount Cadrona Station in a couple of months. So we're building all over the place. Um, very quickly, some just some examples of what we've done to date. Uh, near and Square, you'll know that development down around the Hayes there. We built that um, 10 years ago now. You can see it's actually when we finished it. So we started a bit before then. That was our first development. The homes are probably a bit bigger than in terms of floor area than what we build now, but we did, we did cut our teeth on this one and we, we're still quite proud of it. See me, <laughs> very proud. Um, Suffolk Street, so this is an arrow town next to Jack Reed Park. Council gave us a land for a dollar um, and we've transformed it from what was essentially a trailer park into this beautiful little 10 lot um, development. You've got the four sort of cottage-like Arrowtown character homes along the front and then we've got another six along the back. We have um, two that are retained for senior housing as well. Shot over country, we built 44 homes down here on land that we received from the developer. Um, this was probably the last of the big ones that went through under shared ownership and then we switched. In 2019 we launched our secure home program, also in shot over country. This is down in the lower levels, Chill Lane, and we launched our launched our program there. From then on in, Hikawai over in Wanaka, we're building, and we're, we're allocating homes, and we always do mixed tenure allocations, but we're allocating them under our rentals and secure home program. Toru, you'll recognize this one just over here. Unfortunately, at the moment, only one of these buildings has been built, and it's proving really challenging for the developer um, to make the finances stack up to build the other two, but it is consented for another two buildings of high density um, and 158 total units to come. So we really, really want this had to happen. The first 
first stage, we bought 50 units off the developer. We sold eight on the open market and we've kept 42. We've put 26 into our secure home program. And there, because it was a bit more challenging to separate the land from the improvements, we said, rather than get a valuer to tell us what the land value is, um, let's just find what, what is going to work for the households. And we found that the sweet spot was if it cost us 440, which it did back then on average to buy a one bed property, we sold them to the households for 50% of that. So they only had to come up with 220 through mortgage and deposit. And then we got central government to come in and fund the other 220. So in theory, it became a cash neutral position transaction for us for those secure home properties. Um, we also put 15 into public housing under a 25 year contract with the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development. So I think 10 of those 15 are actually seniors. Um, there sometimes there's a bit of, <clears throat> I think, misunderstanding around what public housing looks like, um, particularly when you hear stories out of Auckland. But certainly down here, the people that we're helping are, are quite a different demographic to what you might see in, in the North Island particularly. Um, so yeah, big success story for us, and we would love to see the other two buildings go ahead lady. Um, we, so we finished this one off down, at, that's also down in Lake Hayes Estate from that was development uh, contributions that came out of the Queenstown Country Club, the developer there. We put, I think we've actually now got 11 in our secure home property because one of our initial, they went in as rent to buy and now they've transitioned into secure home. So that's happening. Just, just before we, at Easter we finished off 10 homes in North Lake. We've got them, people all lined up for them now, or moved in, sorry. And this is the big one that we're working on at the moment. So uh, Tewa Banks, which has got the Arrowtown Golf Club on both sides, if you don't know where it is. It's Jop Street in Arrowtown. 3.7 hectares. Council gave us the land for a dollar again. Um, this is going to be an absolute game changer for the people of Arrowtown who are on lower to moderate incomes. I think... Oh, close to 20% of the homes that we're designing are going to be fully accessible or accessible ready. Um, we're putting in ground source heating, which means that instead of having your traditional heat pump, the heat actually, we're drilling at the moment, drilling 100 metres down into the rock and pipes will go down there in the, I'm not going to get into the technical details, but they bring, but they bring the heat up and it's going to be an absolute game changer for the uh, households in there. So I can't wait to do a bit of a case study on it and see what their numbers come out like. Um, we're also building 28 homes over in Hawea at the moment um, and we'll have a total of 60 come across sections coming across to us at some stage. That's me. Does that work? Yeah, that works. <laughs> Does this work? Yeah. Is this working? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> this is working. Uh, thanks, Julie, for all the awesome work that you do. Um, does anyone have questions? Or was that just so comprehensive, so comprehensive and informative? I have a question. This is a random one. Where's, was it Longview? Yeah. Where's oh, that? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's sorry. That's sorry. You did answer that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So, yeah, potentially for people who want to are uh, happy to commute or can work remotely, this is a good opportunity. We have got a lot of um, developments coming on stream in Wanaka, the Wanaka wider area over the next couple of years. So um, that's will be most of the opportunities will be apart from the 68 homes in Arrowtown. Great. Any questions? Oh, for, for the construct to buy in under the secure home program, um, hopefully around the same. Yeah, it, the cost of construction is going up significantly and proving really, really challenging. So we are getting to the stage where we're having to look at different ways, and maybe maybe we end up selling the homes under the program at less than what it cost us to build it. And because ultimately, if it costs six hundred thousand to build a house which it potentially can, um, none of our households can afford that. When your income's capped at 130 and you um, possibly have a couple of kids and a lower deposit, the numbers don't stack up. So we're a not-for-profit 
and ultimately our goal is to help people into homes and we just have to go out and seek additional maybe central government funding to help bring the numbers down to keep the program um, feasible otherwise it falls over. But we'll also be putting 15, hopefully, I haven't had it confirmed yet, but 15 into public housing in, in Narrowtown as well. A really good mixture. So we've got six one-bedders that we've allocated for senior housing, which will be sit at the front of the street, um, and then right throughout twos, threes and fours. Lots of threes, actually. For example, you, you put there some eligibilities. Mm. If we look at it from the business point of view that to secure them for their staff, how does it apply? So one of the key eligibility criteria is that they do have to have, well, at least one person in the house has to have New Zealand, well, New Zealand residency. Um, not necessarily permanent residency, but residency or citizenship. So unfortunately at the moment, our mandate is not to help transient workers who are on working visas. In saying that, we still see that there's a really clear issue and we're working with the Chamber and others, Council, to come up with solutions to this current rental crisis and I think Marie from Council is going to talk a bit more about what we're doing there. So we're working with them but in terms of actually getting onto our waiting list, if what, if you are in it, you're a couple or you're a single and you don't, you're on a working holiday visa then you won't be eligible for our programs unfortunately. Yeah, it has to, so we don't we don't do that directly with businesses. It has to be with the individuals, because that's where we get all our funding, and that's the um, mandate for the funding is it has to be with individuals. Um, in a crazy rental market that we live in in our area, uh, how do you set the rental uh, figure for the people in the trust? Yeah, that's a good question, and it's one that we struggle with because ultimately want we are here to deliver affordable housing, but some of our programs operate on, like the rent to buy program operates on a market rent. So we look at, um, we talk to the lovely Haley from House Smart, and we get some, and we look at the um, tenancy services, what the, their data shows, and we establish what a market rent is, and then we move to the lower quartile of that. <laughs> and we sort of sit in there. And then our affordable rental program, so households who still can't afford that market, lower quartile market rent, we might put them in an affordable rental program and then we can go down to 70 or 80% of market rent. So that's how we get around that. And with public housing, we don't set the rents. If you qualify for public housing, which not many people do because it is the, the income cap is around 55,000 before tax for a household. But, and don't quote me on that, you would need to check the website, but if you qualify for that, the government MSD sets your rent um, and then tops us up to market rent. So it's a bit of a win-win for us in the household. We get full market rent, government pay, uh, household pays what they can afford, and the government's, central government's paying the subsidy. Great. Oh, one more question. David, you've got to have the microphone so people online can um, with the building costs rising the way that they are, that's obviously really putting some pressure on, on you and, and the owners. High density building, obviously you've, you've addressed that, that the developer's struggling in that area. Um, so two parts of that. Do you see high density um, building actually becoming more important because of the building costs uh, increases uh, into that? And secondly, what do you think the chances are of stage two and three actually going ahead? Mm. I think, yes, I totally agree that high density housing um, is becoming more and more important. Unfortunately, the, actual, the cost of constructing high density housing is part of the issue as well. It used to be quite affordable and now it's, it's really challenging. So the developers are saying to us, it is cheaper to build a three-level walk-up on the remainder of that Toro site rather than to start going up because you, there's so much more involved and you have to put in lifts and the works. So I think, 
But I think high density housing is more important because of this land issue. Right? Where's all our land coming from? Well, we've got mountains all around us. We need to go up, not out. So in, in appropriate areas. The second part, what are the chances of it happening? I think are really good. We're on a bit of a mission to try and make it happen. Um, we're talking to central government, Kaingaora and HUD. Um, central government doesn't put a lot of funding into housing in this district. So um, we think that they've got a really important role to play and we see this as a, a key site for, for them playing their part. We've just, um, the Joint Housing Action Plan, as Council's just released that for feedback, public feedback, and um, that's part of central government's part of that. So, you know, boy, we're saying to them, put your money where your mouth is. Yeah. And when Minister Woods was down saying we need to build more houses to get out of this crisis, now seems like a good time for, yeah. for you to strike. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Thanks, Julie. Oh, one question online. I'll read that out. Given the speed of development is possibly going to slow, be capped, how do you intend to keep momentum and growth of providing housing not dependent on private developers? Yeah. Uh, that is a good point, and it's something, you know, we've got, as I said, we've got this goal of 1,000 homes by 2038. We are not going to get to 1,000 homes with inclusionary housing alone. We know that, so we're looking all the time at other opportunities. The Toru is a, is a great example of that. Nothing to do with inclusionary housing, but we came in, we said to the developer, we support what you're doing, we want to buy some. Um, and then we bring in the additional funding from central government to make it work. So that's how we want to get there. We're always looking for opportunities to partner with developers to get more housing outside of what we're doing with the inclusionary zone. Great. Thanks, Julie. We better move on now to House Smart. Hayley. You get my glasses on. I'm sure it's not a reflection of my age, or maybe it is. I've started renting to second generation now, so might be. okay. Well, thanks for coming, and uh, for those that I haven't met, let me introduce myself. Hayley Stevenson. I'm part of the House Mark team. Um, and I've got Julie, Jessica and Rachel here with us today, with me today to um, answer the more technical questions. They're more qualified than me. Um, well, housing, it's um, certainly been a very hot topic um, over the last few weeks. Um, managed to get myself in a bit of an argument with Megan Woods over it and um, <laughs> don't think she'll be putting me on the Christmas card list anytime soon. She was quite pleased to get rid of me, I think. But I think all those conversations have certainly been worthwhile because I really do see some action being taken um, with the council, with uh, the local community as well. Certainly over the last couple of weeks I've had, or the last week actually, I've had people coming in saying we've pulled out of Airbnb. Um, I've decided to put my um, house up for rental. Um, so I think even those conversations, some of them at the time feel like they're a bit negative. We are starting to see some positives come out of it. So let's uh, start. I've got a wee disclaimer at the start. So what Housemart does is we are a long-term residential property management company. So we rent, we don't do short-term, we don't do uh, less than 90 days, we do long-term tenancies. But I'm going to try and give you a bit of an overview on the different types of tenancies. So just, um, I've had to actually do some research on this as well, which has been really good. Uh, the rental rates that we've got in the upcoming slides are based on our portfolio. We do operate a wee bit differently from other companies. We probably sit at the lower end of the rental rates. Um, we like to make it affordable, if we can use that word in this market, for our clients that rent our houses and also come to us to rent out our houses. Uh, so the rates are based on our company's um, affordability 
Also, I've got some information in there about service tenancies and boarding houses. It's not something that we do, um, but I think it's interesting for you. So why are we in this position that we're in? Um, I've been in town that long. Um, I've seen this cycle before, and um, maybe I've got another cycle left in me. Yeah, maybe not. It might be over to the rest of the team. Um, but it, it's certainly an issue that comes up. Well, probably a lot of us will remember the big lines outside the mountain scene waiting for the paper to come out. So now it's all online, so it's just um, same story but a different version. But what we have um, got that's added into it is the changes to the RTA, um, which is the Residential Tenancy Act. So I do think this has had a really big impact. So in, in a nutshell, we can't, we can't do the RTA in 20 minutes, but in a bit of a nutshell, what has happened with all these seasonal rentals, and this really has affected Wanaka probably more so than us, is that people would use their houses over summer, they would come to us and we would rent them out over winter. So I had a company in Wanaka as well, so I've seen it from both sides of the hill. So Wanaka had a lot more short term than us, um, but still we had a number of short term tenancies. So people would come to us round about now, we would do a fixed term tenancy on their property starting, say now, for five to six months, for a start date and it would have an end date. And after a winter, uh, that termination date would come up and the tenants would move out. And it's great. Um, and this is what my argument with Megan Woods was over. So the changes to the RTA have taken that ability away from us to give the owner 100% guarantee when the end of fixed term date comes up, the tenants will move out. Now you need to have a reason to end that tenancy if the tenants decide they don't want to move. So 95% of people will do what they intended to do. They only want to take it for that fixed term. But I can't give our owners 100% guarantee that they will move out. So that was my point to Megan Woods. We need that um, section of the RTA looked at again. The other impact in people renting their homes out is you would have heard it um, bantered around no cause eviction notice, which actually sounds awful, that wording. It's a 90 day notice. So if you were on a periodic tenancy um, and you're an owner and your situation changed, you could give a 90 day notice to end that tenancy. I think the way a lot of groups have bantered it around, it, it, it sounds like uh, no cause eviction, that you can do that midway through a fixed term tenancy or something. So you can't. But those two changes have had quite an impact and led us to the position that we're in. Uh, these rental prices here are based off a rental portfolio. So it will change from company to company. Now what we um, do is we only do, you have to come to us as a group and we rent you a whole house. So you can't come as a head tenant, sub tenant. Um, so we are looking at the long term workers in um, like a stable group in our rentals. We like to go market rate and the, the market rates are high. We don't set the rates, the market does. However, I had a, I jumped on Trade Me, there are currently 22 houses listed. There's a range there of between 4,000 per week, which is a high-end property on the Crown Range, um, down to 450 per week, which is one bedroom at Hanley's Farm. Now there are some properties on there that are above market rate. Um, there's a four bedroom house on there sitting at 1600 per week. 
Um, now, just because it's advertised at that rate does not make it market rate. Um, and we have seen in the past a lot of properties have sat there a long time because they are above market rate. So something we can do as uh, rental companies, we will not, if our owner come to us and wanted us to advertise it $500 above what we deem as market rate, we won't do it. And hopefully a lot of the other rental agencies will um, opt into that as well because especially if it's a rental agency advertising it way above market rate the general public deem that to be the market rate of the property and um, then it just snowball effects so uh, that is a bit of a problem so what can we do to help in the situation now um, for a start, an easy one, if employers can let um, staff members have time off work to go to these viewings. So we have people applying for properties that haven't viewed them. Um, we need our clients to view the properties. Um, and again, that is our company policy. Um, the, for the clients that are renting uh, the properties, the tenants, Look to get on uh, each. The, look around all the companies. Um, we have. A, you can register on our website, and as soon as we list a property, it will email it straight to you. Um, so, you know, go around all the companies. Get your team if they're looking for rentals. You know, cast the net wide. They, if they can't make a viewing, send um, another staff member or a friend along to view the property on their behalf. So what we're doing is probably trying to eliminate some of the risk for us where I've advertised a property, somebody wants to take it sight unseen and um, then they come in to sign the lease and it's, but in their mind it's not what they had um, envisioned. So make sure somebody comes along. Get the staff members and the companies, get organised. If we can have a bit of a resume um, to put to the owners, because these properties we don't own. So we are just trying to sell the sizzle to the owners. And a lot of the owners um, are still either a bit nervous about renting to businesses, whereas, say, um, you know, uh, we say to an owner, it's an electrical company, for instance, that's wanting to take a lease on a property. They're worried that they're just going to have an open door policy and multiple people rolling through that property. Now, when a company looking for a staff house is up against a family, um, it doesn't mean either is going to be better than the other, but we've got to sell to the owner why this is a good option. Uh, we won't get into offering the owner higher rent. Uh, we won't do that. But sometimes what you can do is the company can, or the director from the company can go listed on the tenancy agreement as well as the extra bit of security. Or we've seen uh, companies offer a cleaner put in there. We'll have a cleaner come through the house once a week uh, will provide a gardener. So just um, providing an extra bit of security uh, for those owners to consider those applications. Um, sometimes written references, so they're all ready to go. If the clients that are looking to rent get their profile together and contact details on the written references because some of them we get are a wee bit marginal. Um, QLDC and partners are launching a community call to action campaign encouraging home owners to rent empty rooms to workers over the winter. Um, online content will be published providing accommodation to and community resources and information for workers seeking accommodation um, in the Queenstown area for this winter. So, you know, it, 
a room is going for round about 250 now so a lot of locals if you've got a spare room to help with winter costs um, you know it could be a really good option some of the types of tenancies um, we've separated there we do periodic and fixed term but there are other types of tenancies so I'm going to give you a rough outline of these periodic tenancy it's the easiest one you can get it has no end date it continues until the tenant or the landlord gives notice at the end of it um, with we didn't used to do a lot of periodic tenancies but now with changes again to the RTA with assignment periodic tenancies are coming more common fixed term tenancies traditional old tenancy where you have a start and an end date now the difference is that um, it, if it is not terminated it will automatically roll on to a periodic tenancy unless the landlord or the tenant give the correct notice to end it or a new fixed term is entered into. Notice to end a tenancy. So this is where it has um, a big change. So at the end of a fixed term, if we get to the end uh, date and the tenants don't vacate or you want them to vacate, you need to have a reason. So it's a 90-day notice if the property is going on the market for sale. Um, if the property is changing to commercial premises. So this was a real grey area when these changes come in. And as a company, we were actually saying, no, you can't give notice under this to go to Airbnb. But it's been challenged at Tenancy Tribunal. And uh, there's currently two cases where it's been approved that you can give notice to go to Airbnb, which is another real slap in the face um, for us. 90-day um, notice for extensive redevelopment or the property is going to be demolished. 63 days notice um, if the owner or family member is going to be living in the property. So this must be a permanent place of residence. So a lot of people have said, well, at the end of that five months fixed term with my holiday home, I'll just give this notice and I'll move back in. But it must become your permanent place of residence for at least 90 days. So we can't actually use that for some of these holiday homes here. Um, the owner has acquired the premises for occupation of their employees. So... Um, it, you must, the, you can't um, fudge these notices, like, you know, you can't try and adapt them to a situation. People, it must be legitimate reasons. A tenant also can give 28 days notice at the, coming up to the end of the tenancy to terminate their tenancy. And again, if it goes over that, fixed term it becomes to um, it becomes a periodic tenancy right flat sharing um, agreements so if you are not listed on a tenancy agreement you're a flatmate so then you need a flatmate agreement so all what I'm talking about um, here at the end of this presentation I've got links to all these and certainly the chamber can share all this information um, and we've got a link there to a flat sharing agreement um, if you should if you're taking on um, if you've got a lease on a property and you are going to take on uh, just additional flatmate you need to get the permission of the owner because it'll be stated how many people are allowed to reside in the property um, so you'll need to get, check with the property manager or the home owner first um, with a flat sharing agreement you can write in uh, responsibilities and rights there if there is no agreement it's sort of deemed that it'll default back to two weeks notice 
A flat sharing agreement, the disputes are dealt with with the dis disputes tribunal and not the tenancy tribunal. So the flat sharing agreements sit outside the RTA. Service tenancy. Now, we don't do these, but um, I actually, it was quite interesting. I had to look up and, um, and do a bit of study on these. So I think these will become more... Um, traditional tenancies now where a lot of businesses are actually buying staff accommodation. So this is where the employer provides the employee accommodation and they are also the landlord. They are covered by the RTA and they must comply with the healthy home standard. Key differences are the employer can deduct uh, the rent from the uh, staff members' wages the tenancy usually ends when the employment ends. NZ Ski would probably be a prime example of that once their contract ends, so does that. Landlord or tenant must give 14 days notice at the end of the tenancy if the employment has ended. Now, another um, step further than these service tenancies, um, and the last day I've had um, a discussion with uh, Matthew, Matthew Edwards from Berry & Co. And he's been doing some commercial leases. So a company has entered into a commercial lease to rent a residential property. Um, so I've checked with him that I can actually let you know about that. And I'm not 100% sure how they work, but you can certainly contact Matthew at Berry & Co. because he's... Um, done a few of those. A short fixed term tenancy. Now this is um, a tenancy that is less than 90 days. These tenancies sit outside the RTA um, and they must not go over 90 days or they automatically become a periodic tenancy and then they will capture the RTA. So you're probably thinking for a seasonal rental, why don't we just do a couple of short fixed term tenancies, um, which we actually can't do because I looked into that. If I could, you know, rent, put the tenancy in one tenant's name and then put the second tenancy in another tenant's name, but because they're occupants, it would uh, capitulate us back into the RTA. But for it was designed for emergency housing situations um, and certainly with some of our holiday homes here for less than three months it could be an option to get a roof over somebody's head. Boarding houses, again, something we don't do. Um, each tenant enters into their own agreement with the landlord to uh, rent a room or a sleeping area in that room. So uh, they all hold their own agreement. Um, it must last for at least 28 days. It is subject to the RTA. Uh, it must comply with tenancy law and then there are additional rules for boarding houses regarding um, health and safety and fire regulations. Boarding houses, you know, these have been subject to some of um, the less desirable accommodation in town, I think they absolutely serve a purpose for the ones that are done correctly. Um, so here are links to what was in the presentation. Um, there will be probably questions on individual situations. It's impossible to give you all um, 101 RTA in, in 20 minutes or less. So, um, Rachel, Julie and Jessica um, and myself, we're happy to stay afterwards to talk to you individually about um, your individual situations. So, rather than, because I know we're short on time, rather than soaking up on individual um, cases, feel free to either stay behind, we'll talk to you, or contact us at Housemark.
And that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Hayley. That was really interesting. And also, it's quite confusing, isn't it? Yeah. All the different um, types of tendencies. Any questions? Um, I do have one that might be relevant to other people as well. Um, when looking for a service tenancy agreement, I can find a tenancy agreement. Is it the same paperwork that I use, but it automatically becomes a service tenancy because I'm their employer? Or do I put a note where there's a note? I have written, like I thought I'd just write a note going, this is a service tenancy. Is that is that appropriate or? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Um, right. Because um, it includes the RTA. So get, you can use the same agreement, but you write in the conditions. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Another question? <laughs> Um, I read in the paper recently that rent is, so for landlords, um, for business owners that want to rent a property for staff housing, they found that landlords have upped the rent if they know that the housing is being used for that. Have you seen that occur or not? I, I haven't actually seen it, but I've heard about it, which is absolutely disgraceful. So, um, and it is against... Um, changes to the RTA that the rent advertised you can't get into Dutch auction type thing so I would point that out so if it's advertised at that rent um, you know we've seen exactly that years and years ago with the film crews when they come here as soon as it had film crew in the wording people were chucking an extra 500,000 bucks on it so it shouldn't be um, that way, but yeah, no, I have heard that. Yeah. Just a quick one, Hayley. Um, so what's the penalties if someone doesn't comply with, you know, like at the end of, you know, say, for instance, like a periodic term that they finish it and don't follow through on, you know, selling the house or renovating mm -hmm. or whatever? Right. Um, can you pull out your RTA and tell me? <laughs> <laughs> um, look, there, there are fines, and some of the fines, I can't remember exactly, which might also reflect my age, um, but some of the fines are up to $4,000, but some of them also, um, through the tribunal, you could end up getting the tenancy reinstated. So we have had um, owners come to us and said, you know, can you issue this notice? I'm going to do this. And we're like, well, that is not going to be your permanent place of residence. So we will refuse to issue the notice because when you sign a lease agreement um, for like House Mart, we put our name at the top. We, In the eyes of the law, we're deemed to be the landlord. So we're going to carry that fine. So... You know, there is, depending on the severity and if somebody's been dodgy, they will. Especially now, you know, people trying to give notice to go to Airbnb. If they don't go to Airbnb, which is very easy for a tenant to see whether they have or not, you could end up getting that tenancy reinstated, having to compensate the tenants, um, Rent, yeah, it could be quite costly. Yeah, that was yeah. That was look, my question. Who's policing it? Well, the tenants are the best ones to police it themselves. So they've been affected. It's twenty dollars to put your application into the tribunal. Um, collect your information and it's not going to be hard and it, it's unfortunate and I think the people that are doing that is very small amount um, versus yeah it is very small number that are really being dodgy like yesterday I just had a look on air portfolio only 18% of our owners actually reside in Queenstown. Um, they are all, you know, wider New Zealand or overseas. So a lot of people 
doing things like that, going to Airbnb or moving back in um, as a holiday home is probably higher than them going to Airbnb because a lot of them just don't reside here, so they're not going to be running it that way. I, thanks, Hayley. I was quite interested in that short-term, short fixed-term tenancy, so under 90 days. Is that, um, so that's different in the fact that it actually doesn't roll over to periodic after the 90 days, so it's a truly fixed term. Yes, yep. Mm, so, um, and, you know, like they say, uh, to work for the Conservation Department, first you had to be a poacher. Um, so to be good at it and this is so we were looking at ways to get around the RTA to help solve our emergency housing and so we were looking to um, maybe roll those 90 days over seeing if there was a loophole mm. to do that but there's not. Um, but at least than the 90 days, certainly if there's a holiday home sitting there empty that can provide a roof over somebody's head, yep, absolutely, go ahead. Yeah, I, just, I think that's quite interesting because given, you know, people sleeping in their cars, I mean, I mean a, th a three month, a home for three months yep. would actually be, you know, quite attractive. And I'm not, I'm wondering if many landlords or homeowners which is a term I prefer, <laughs> um, yeah. are aware that there's that option? Uh, certainly the ones that phone into the office, um, we make them aware that that is an option. Yeah. Um, homeowners are really nervous about not being able to get their properties back, which is a fair call. Um, so that there is a safeguard, but it's unfortunate that then it probably means for the rest of the winter it's going to sit there empty for a couple of months because they're too nervous to go over that 89 days. Yeah. I just have a really quick question. If you're buying or selling a property that has a fixed term tenancy in place, what happens with that? So depending, if you're buying uh, or selling, the, the tenancy agreement makes up part of that sale. The conditions of the agreement go forward with that sale. And if you, you can either give notice uh, for vacant possession at the end of that tenancy, but uh, a common thing um, with tenancies, if you sell it and carry on the fixed term, even the chattels, the conditions of that uh, property get sold. So you can't buy a property that... Um, is furnished and the vendors decided at settlement he'll take the furniture you must replace the furniture to carry on because it makes up part of that fixed term tenancy as well yeah just another quick one um so if like for instance nz ski rented a house from someone and then gave it to staff they could then cancel the rental agreement if they laid off, the, like at the end of the fix, the season, they lay off the staff, they could actually cancel it within 12, 14 days, couldn't they? No, if, no, yes, no. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's lots of different layers to that. If they've bought a house with a fixed term tenancy in place, that's not a service tenancy. So, in, or unless it is a service ten, no, it won't be because they're a new employer, so it would be an old fixed term tenancy. So no, they can't issue. It's only when they are the owner of that dwelling, and then they are the owner and the employer, and then they put their employees in, they can do one of those service tenancies. But if you're on a normal fixed term tenancy, no. That, that is different, and this is where um, Matthew Edwards from Berry & Co um, has not found a loophole, but has entered a couple of these companies into commercial arrangements 
um, that there can be um, benefits that it can sit outside the RTA, which is it's sometimes a good thing and sometimes not so good. But when we're talking about seasonal rentals here, it's definitely an option for employers to explore um, looking at that commercial option. So they can either purchase or rent a residential property, rent it from the landlord under a commercial arrangement, and then the next layer down, do a service tenancy um, with some of their employees. So it, um, there's a lot of layers to it. We are running over time. However, I've got one question online that we, hopefully, if that's okay, we'll make that our last question. Um, what other, and this is important actually around, um, you spoke about potentially a campaign encouraging locals to, um, to take in a worker over winter. What are the rules around someone coming into a room in your house? Are they a flatmate and therefore not bound by any of these? Um, you know, if you're the homeowner and you get a, a, a someone in, yep, you're not bound by any of these. No. So, um, and Marie from the council has done a lot of great work um, around taking adopt a worker or taking in a worker, which is coming out. Soon. We will it's hear more about soon. that soon. Yeah, yeah. it's coming soon, out soon. soon. Um, and it's a great idea, and we're already seeing people um, doing this. So, but you would go onto one of these links here and get yourself a flatmate agreement. Okay. Yeah, that's good to know. So the I, the catch there, if you're the homeowner, uh, certainly put them on the flatmate agreement. If you are leasing the property, first check the number of occupants you're allowed in the property. Go to the property manager. Um, first and see if you're permitted to take in an extra flatmate with you. Yep. Okay. And certainly don't um, hesitate to call one of us at Housemart at any stage. We're, we're happy to share our knowledge with the community and help where we can. Thank you, Hayley. That was really informative. Uh, so Hayley and her team are going to be around for a little while after this session. If you've got any um, questions you want to ask directly one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and thank you all for coming today. Uh, we have, we're putting the video, so all the videos from each of the three sessions uh, will be on our website, um, so you can re-watch them. Uh, and also we're pulling together some toolkits with, um, with key facts from each session um, that we will distribute um, as soon as we can as well. So thank you. Uh, have a great Friday. See ya.